Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this is October 9th, 2024, and we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 9, Text 34, which is also Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, Chapter 1, Text 54. Ritter tam yat parieta na pratieta chatmani tad vidyad atmano mayam yata baso yatatamaha rite without artam value Yat, that which, pratieta, appears to be, na, not, pratieta, appears to be, cha, and, atmani, in relation to me, tat, that, vidyat, you must know, atmanaha, my, mayam, illusory energy, Yata, just as, abhasa, the reflection, yata, as, tamaha, the darkness. Srila Prabhupada's translation from the Bhagavatam. O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. Mogi Chua Prabhupada's translation from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. What appears to be truth without me is certainly my illusory energy, for nothing can exist without me. It is like a reflection of a real light in the shadows, for in the light there are neither shadows nor reflections. So the Chaitanya Charitamrita purport is, is much shorter than the Bhagavatam purport, but I'm going to read a little bit um, from each. So in the Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada's talking about creation, maintenance, and destruction. And he's talking about re- removing a thing from its relationship from the Lord is called illusion. Then he says, misconceiving one thing for another is called illusion. For example, accepting a rope as a snake is illusion, but the rope is not false. This rope, as it exists in front of the illusion person, is not at all false, but the acceptance is illusory. Anything that appears as apparently not produced out of my energy is called maya. The conception that the living entity is formless, or that the Supreme Lord is formless, is also illusion. So this is going to be a very important point we'll be talking about. In the Bhagavad Gita 2.12, it was said by the Lord in the midst of the battlefield that the warriors standing in front of Arjuna, Arjuna himself, and even the Lord, had all existed before. They were existing on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, and they would all continue to be individual personalities in the future also, even after the annihilation of the present body, and even after being liberated from the bondage of material existence. In all circumstances, the Lord and the living entities are individual personality, and the personal features of both the Lord and the living entities are never abolished. Only the influence of the illusory energy, the reflection of light and the darkness can, by the mercy of the Lord, be removed. The independence of the individual living being is, again, I'm not reading the whole purport. The independence of the individual living entity is not real independence, but is just a reflection of the real independence existing in the Supreme Being, the Lord. The false claim of supreme independence by the conditioned souls is illusion. Person with the forefront of knowledge become illusioned, and therefore the so-called scientists, physiologists, empiric philosophers, etc., become dazzled by the glaring reflection of the sun, moon, electricity, and deny the existence of the Supreme Lord. 
The medical practitioner may deny the existence of the soul in the physiological bodily construction of an individual person, but he cannot give life to a dead body, even though all the mechanisms of the body exist after death. The psychologist makes a serious study of this physiological condition of the brain, as if the construction of the cerebral lump were the machine of the functioning mind. But in the dead body, the psychologist cannot bring back the function of the mind. All such advancements of science and knowledge in the present context of material civilization is but an action of the covering influence of the illusory energy. The illusory energy has two phases of existence, namely the covering and the throwing influence. By the throwing influence, the illusory energy throws the living entity into the darkness of ignorance, and by the covering of influence, she covers the eyes of men with a four, poor fund of knowledge. I love that phrase of Prabhupada, poor fund of knowledge. You don't have much knowledge in your bank account. About the existence of the supreme person who enlightened the supreme individual living being, Brahma. Okay, I'm going to look at the Chaitanya Charitamrita purport. In the previous verse, the absolute truth and its nature have been explained. One must also understand the relative truth to actually know the absolute. The relative truth, which is called maya, or material nature, is explained here. Maya has no independent existence. One who is less intelligent is captivated by the wonderful activities of maya, but he does not understand that behind these activities is a direction of the Supreme Lord. The real nature of maya, the illusory energy, is clearly explained in the Bhagavatam. The absolute truth is substance, and relative truth depends upon its relationship with the absolute for its existence. Maya means energy, therefore the relative truth is explained to be the energy of the absolute truth. When the material manifestation appears very wonderful, that is also a perverted reflection of the supreme sunshine, the absolute truth, as compared in the Vedanta Sutra. As darkness is situated far away from the sun, so the material world is also far away from the spiritual world. The Vedic literature directs us not to be captivated by the dark regions, tamaha, but to try to reach the shining regions of the absolute, yogi dhamma. That which is relative, temporary, and far away from the absolute truth is called maya, or ignorance. This illusion is exhibited in two ways, as explained in the Bhagavad Gita. The inferior illusion is, inter is inert matter, and the superior illusion is the living entities. The living entities are called illusory in this context only because they are implicated in the illusory structures and activities of the material world. Actually, the living entities are not illusory, for they are parts of the superior energy of the Supreme Lord and do not have to be covered by maya if they do not want to be so. The actions of the living entities in the spiritual kingdom are not illusory. They are the actual eternal activities of liberated souls. So again, I was just reading some certain sections from each of the purports. So it's very important to know what's real and what's false. Am I correct? Isn't that kind of an important thing in life? Like Krishna defines sattva gun, as you know, what is binding, what is liberating, what is to be feared, what is not to be feared, what is to be done, what is not to be done. And this is the main question we ask of ourselves every single day, all the time. What should I do? What should I not do? What's going to be good? What's going to be bad? What will bind me? What will liberate me? What is truth and what is false? I mean, even if we're just buying something at the shop, you know, is this a healthy food or is it a non-healthy food? Right? Is this a person I can trust? Is this a person I can't? This, this is a constant. We're, we're asking this question almost at every moment. What's going to be good for me? What's going to be bad for me? And as we advance in spiritual life, we ask this in terms of what's Krishna's desire? What does Krishna want? Which of my desires are good? We're not just asking, you know, what's, what's a good and bad mobile phone? or what's a good and bad, you know, plum at the shop, but we're asking, what's a good and bad desire that I have? What's a good and bad thought that I have? What, which, what consciousness is right and what consciousness is wrong? What's actually aligned with the spiritual and what isn't? 
So here in the, this, this, this is one of my absolute favorite verses anywhere because it just, as part of this concise statement of Siddhanta of these four verses, it basically defines our whole practice of Krishna consciousness. And again, I want to read this translation again. Whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. So Artam, we think something has value, but if we don't see its relationship to Krishna, then that seeing of not relationship to Krishna is an illusion. The perception of value outside of relationship to Krishna is like a reflection in darkness. It doesn't have any substance to it. So here we're being told uh, by Krishna himself, by Srila Prabhupada, that we have to know both illusion and reality, which is very significant. I would say of all of the religions and spiritual philosophies of the world, not many of them describe the nature of matter and the nature of illusion very well. Whereas we have very detailed, if you think about Sankhya philosophy, for example, you know, even in the Bhagavad Gita, the descriptions of the gunas, and the descriptions of the workings of Prakriti, but then you get into like the second and third cantos of the Bhagavatam, and the, the details of descriptions of how the material energy works are amazing. So we have to know both. Right? And this is, of course, stated very clearly where that we have to know both. In the Ishopanishad. You can't be liberated just by understanding one. You have to understand both. You have to understand what is reality and what is illusion. And the real, the reality, the spiritual, our spiritual desires, the Lord's desires and the good are all things when we understand something in relationship to Krishna. And the false, the bad, what's not Krishna's desire is when we understand things out of relationship to Krishna. It's really just that simple. Now what's also amazing, is that the energy that allows us to see things as separate from Krishna is also Krishna's. Matasmatyarganam apohanamcha. He also gives forgetfulness. We cannot see things without a relationship to him, without the relationship to him of maya. That's why it's such an amazing illusion. The energy that allows us to think this has nothing to do with Krishna, that energy has something to do with Krishna. So it's a complete illusion. You know, your parents have given you toys to play with and you think, I'm doing something my parents don't want me to do by playing with these toys, but they've given them to you. They've given you that facility. All right, you want to do this, then you can do it. Prabhupada gives the example of children who want, little children who want to cook, and so the parents give them, you know, bits of clay and, and toy pots, and okay, you can, you can cook over there. So, like that. And when we see ourselves and everything in relation to Krishna and act in that consciousness, then we are not in illusion and when we're not in illusion, we're not in the material world. Now, we can talk about the material world as a geographical location. Right? And Prabhupada talks about that. The material world is very far away from the spiritual world. And we even have paintings showing, you know, this painting on the cover of the first canto, showing here's the geography of the spiritual world and the material world. But remember we talked about yesterday, right? The first aspect of illusion is time and cause and effect, right? And then what's the, in, in creating illusion, the first of the Mahabhutas that Krishna creates is space. This whole concept of space that we have is also an illusion. Of course, we, we can't fathom that. Like, how can there be a reality where there's no time, there's no cause and effect, and there's no space? What does that mean? 
and especially we read the descriptions of the spiritual world, and Krishna wakes up, and he has breakfast, and he goes to the forest. It sounds like time to me, and it sounds like space, because he's, there's 12 forests of Vrindavan, and there's the forests of the different seasons, and I, I filter that through my material consciousness, and I go, well, that sounds like time and space to me. But, but clearly it's not. You know, my, my god brother, my late god brother Sadaputapu liked to talk about this a lot. How Krishna's concept of space is so radically different from ours. And he would like to quote the verse, Ekopya so richaitam jagadanda koti yach chakturasti jagadanda chaya yadanta andantarasta paramanu chayantarasta. That Krishna is within every atom and the whole universe is within Krishna. So we can think of either of those separately. So I can think, there's Krishna. Okay, here's Krishna. And Madhya Sora looks in his mouth, and she sees the universe. Okay, fine. So the universe is inside Krishna. Of course, Lord Brahma points out that she is standing outside Krishna, seeing herself in Krishna. And she's not seeing a reflection of herself or a picture of herself. She's actually seeing herself inside Krishna while she's standing outside. So that already goes like, what? Okay, and then we have that Krishna is in every atom. So I can get a picture of that too. I get a picture of like this little tiny, you know, Paramatma. Like we have these paintings like that, right? Where you have, you have like a, a nature scene and then there's a little painting of Paramatma in the tree and in the dog and in every atom. So I, I can picture that, okay. So then I'm going to go into the atom and there's Krishna. And inside Krishna, there's the universe. And inside that universe, Krishna is in every atom, and inside every Krishna in every atom, there's a universe. And, and my concepts of space cannot accommodate this. It makes no sense to me in terms of space. Because the concept of space is part of illusion. So the concept of time, the concept of space, the concept of causality are all part of an illusion. And in the, the spiritual reality, that doesn't exist. I mean, Prabhupada talks about how on the mental platform, right, you can go someplace else in a moment. I, I, can, I can think of another place, and mentally, I'm immediately there. And he says, what to speak of spiritually? You are immediately there. there there's, you don't have to traverse some space to get there. And how this works spiritually, I have no idea. I, I can describe it, and I can repeat what it says in the Shastra and from our Acharyas, and then I stop and I say, okay, I can't, I can't go beyond that. But the point that I want to make is that the material world is really a state of consciousness more than a place. When we think in terms of place, then we think, if I want to go from the material or spiritual, I have to take myself and move myself in space and time from the material world to the spiritual world. Now, there's some reality to that. Like we have the, you know, the descriptions of Dhruva getting in an airplane and traversing the planets, or you know, Gopu Kumar traveling through the material world and through the coverings and coming to the gates of Vaikuntha. So there's something to that. It's not that there's nothing to that. But really, where we are is a matter of our consciousness. Not, not really geography. You know, when I joined the Hare Krishna movement, we defined advancement almost entirely in terms of geography. If you slept in the temple ashrams, then you were a great devotee. If you slept in a temple-owned apartment across the street, well, you were kind of an intermediate devotee. And my God, if you rented your own place two blocks down the road, then you were fringy. So, you know, we had this very geographical idea, right, of where you are. So I want to look first at defining Mahamaya and then defining Yoga Maya. And then I want to look at some really, really far out, amazing, incredible, wow quotes about how to change our consciousness and how when we do that, we are not in the material world.
All right. So the themes that we're looking at in this verse and purport is again that we should understand both Maya and the, the spiritual. And that in the previous verse we learn, right? The previous verse we learned that everything is ultimately Krishna. Before the creation, during the creation, after the creation. And in this purport we learn that only Krishna can give us real light. A conditioned soul cannot give us real light. Okay, so what is Maya? Hmm. Actually, first we should read the summary from Adi 156, where Prabhupada summarizes all four of these verses. So the summary he gives in Adi 156 is this verse further explains that the Lord is detached from the workings of the material energy maya. The living entities, although parts and parcels of Lord Krishna, are prone to be controlled by the external energy. Therefore, although they are spiritual in the material world, they are encased in bodies of material energy. The eternal relationship of the living entities with the Supreme Lord is explained in this verse. All right, so what is maha maya? So in the purport in the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says the identity of the self as being unconnected with the Supreme Self, the Lord, is also illusion. And the false claim that I am the Supreme is the last illusory snare of the same Maya or the external energy of the Lord. So Maya is, I, my existence is disconnected. My personality is disconnected. Or I am God. I'm not just connected, I am the whole. So I am the whole or I have a personality separate from the Lord. So we talked a little bit yesterday about people who say that we have no innate personality. And this is something that Prabhupada is really smashing in this purport where he's referring to the Bhagavad Gita 2.12, I think it is, yes. Yes, 2.12, where Krishna says, never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. So I've challenged some of the people who hold this philosophy and who say, you know, our personality is created at the time of enlightenment. And I've said then, according to this verse in the Bhagavatam, text 34, that we're looking at today, in what sense do we have a personality? How do we have an eternal personality? And they said, well, we have personalities in so many lifetimes. And I said, but according to this verse, those personalities are illusion because they're not connected to the Lord. In order for us to have an eternal personality that is not illusory, that eternal personality must have some connection to the Lord. You all following the logic of this? Illusion is something that's not, that you don't see as connected to the Lord. If I have a personality and you have a personality and you have a personality from beginningless that is real, that personality must be in relationship to the Lord. Therefore, I, it follows logically that I must have some eternal specific relationship to the Lord. What does it mean to be a person? A person means I like certain things and I don't like other things. I have certain opinions that are different from yours. I have certain tastes that are different. I like certain colors. I like certain kinds of food. I like certain kinds of activities. I have a certain kind of what Prabhupada calls nature or temperament. Like we see the liberated souls in the spiritual world. Some of them are very argumentative. Some of them are very submissive. But they have different personalities. Which Rupa Goswami talks about in the Bhakti Vasamrita Sindhu and Ujjwala Nilamani. Right? The, the varieties and the combinations of, of different personalities in terms of their relationship with Krishna. And that must exist without beginning for me to be a person. Prabhupada says here in the purport that both the living entity and the Lord are not formless. That means I must have a form. I must have a nature, I must have certain desires, I must have certain proclivities, and I must have certain form. So Mahamaya is I forget that and I think I have a nature and personality and desires and form that are disconnected from Krishna. It's not like the impersonalists say, right, that the Maya is thinking I have some form and personality 
and reality is realizing I don't have any foreign personality, who's the I that realizes I have no foreign personality is another question. Because that I that's realizing I have no foreign personality must also be part of illusion. Which is what the Buddhists say. You know, the Buddhists say you get detached from your form and personality in this world. You see yourself as the observer, and then you realize there is no observer either. Who is realizing there's no observer? I don't know. You know they, they, they run into a, a, a logical uh, paradox. But Maya is thinking, I have a personality that's not connected with Krishna. Mm -hmm. In the Adilila purport, 54, Prabhupada says, when the material manifestation appears very wonderful, this is due to a perverted reflection of the supreme sunshine. The absolute truth is confirmed in the Vedanta Sutra. Whatever one can see here has its substance in the absolute. So again, if I see things that are wonderful without relationship to Krishna, I see them as wonderful in terms of my enjoying them separately from Krishna. Here's wonderful food for me to enjoy. Here's wonderful nature for me to enjoy. Oh, it, it's just here. You know, I just kind of wake up and there's all these wonderful things here for me to enjoy. And I, I don't think about where they came from or who owns them or, or anything. They're, they were just put here for my pleasure. You know, like a, a little baby who just, just sees playthings and, oh, this is all for me to enjoy. They don't realize my parents have arranged for so seeing myself is not in relationship to Krishna, seeing the world, seeing others, that others are here for me to use as I like. And then in the purport of the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada talked about seeing a rope for a snake, that that's an illusion. But the rope is not false, but you're perceiving it wrongly. You're perceiving it, in this case, as something frightening, something that's benign, we're perceiving as something frightening which reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Krishna book, chapter 20, what I think I mentioned it the other day, where Prabhupada says, for the materialist, the world seems very aggressive. But to those who are in Krishna consciousness, everything is happily situated. And I have found sometimes that when I repeat that quote to devotees, they tell me, aren't you remembering it backwards? Don't the materialists see everything as very happy and the devotees see everything as very aggressive? And I said, then why do you want to be a devotee? It's just going to mess you up. Materialists are saying there's a hard struggle for existence. There's all these obstacles. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm, tr I'm fighting to keep a body alive that's dying and, and falling apart at every moment. I'm, I'm struggling to be comfortable in a situation that is intrinsically uncomfortable. You know, you, you have a few times maybe you have like perfect weather. But, you know, I'm constantly struggling against the elements. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too rainy, it's too dry, it's too windy, it's too this. I, I'm constantly struggling to maintain this body. I mean, how often do we have to eat? And how often do we have to sleep? And how often do we have to drink water? And how often do we have to bathe? And how often do we have to use the toilet? And I mean, it's just, it's, it's never-ending, right? You can't say, well, I bathed and used the toilet once, and that's going to do me for, you know, a month. It, it's a constant thing, so this constant aggressiveness, and then it's a constant aggressiveness with all these other living entities that are all trying to get unlimited happiness from finite resources. And so they're all struggling to possess more and more and more. And there are all these people that are you know, envious of me and what I have and trying to take my stuff, and I'm envious of them and what they have and trying to take their stuff. And we're all pretending to be nice to each other. We're, we're all secretly thinking, how can I use this person for my own purposes? And so therefore the world is very aggressive. But if you're in spiritual consciousness, you don't see it like that at all. You see, om purnam adha purnam idam purnam purnadruchate purnasya purnam adaya purnam eva vasishate. You see, everything is complete. And if you take the infinite from the infinite, you still have the infinite, and I have infinitely everything that I need already. I don't have to strive for anything. And the person who's controlling everything and who is enjoying everything is my best friend, and so everything is beneficial for me. So we don't see like that. So Maya is seeing this 
the, the rope as a snake. Oh, it's aggressive. It, it's fearful. Like where, uh, where my oldest son uh, has a place in Hawaii, I like to take a walk early in the morning before it gets too hot. And there are these street lights and mailboxes that from a distance, with the street light shining on it and stuff, it looks like it's three people walking on the road. And it isn't. When you get up to it, it's just like lampposts and mailboxes. And I know that because I've taken that walk dozens and dozens of times. But still, when I first see it, I always like, who are those three people on the road at, at 4.30 in the morning? You know, so it's, who are they? Are, are, they, are they thieves? Are they murderers? Are they, you know? And then, oh yeah, come on, it's just, this the lamppost, it's just the mailbox. It's not something that you have to be afraid of. So that's, that's the, the illusion. And then Prabhupada also talks in the Bhagavatam purport that thinking that we're supremely independent is an illusion. We have some independence, certainly. But thinking that we're supremely independent, that I can do whatever I like, I can say whatever I like, I can eat whatever I like, I can wear whatever I like, I can go whatever I like, we can't. Right? We, we just can't. If I just, you know, keep going west, I'm going to run into an ocean and I'm stuck. I, I just, I can't. Whether I want to or not, I have to, I have to get a plane or a boat or something. I, I can't just swim across the Atlantic Ocean, even if I'm a very good swimmer. I, I can't just do whatever I want. At a certain point, I have to stop and sleep. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do this today and this today. I can't have a list of a thousand things that I'm going to get done during the day. At a certain point, I, just, I just can't do anymore. And then, you know, I, I can't fly with this body. There's, there's so many things, you know, I'm so, my, I have choice, I have independence, but I'm really constrained by what I can do. I can't say, you know, I think I'm going to become an Olympic athlete, like what's her name, Simone Biles, you know. That I'm, I'm going to choose to do that, you know, I'm going to become a world-class gymnast. And I guarantee you that no matter how much training I were to get right now, there's no way that I could ever do that. I probably couldn't even have done it when I was 15. You know, there's... So we don't have supreme independence. There's reactions to what we do. But we, we do have some, but this thinking, I can do whatever I want. And, and there's so many spiritualists, you know, and New Agers who are like that. You can just do whatever you want. You can get whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. Eh, not really. You know, there, there's limitations. So how does my Mahamaya work? So Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur gives this nice commentary on this verse. He says, Avidya does not destroy real objects, but creates misconceptions. In light, one sees the objects in a house and does not see imaginary thieves. In darkness, one does not see the real objects in a house, but does see imaginary thieves, like my experience with the lamppost. Similarly, in spiritual knowledge, one sees one's spiritual form, of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. In ignorance, one does not see one's eternal, blissful, and knowledgeable nature, although it is present. So again, this is very, very clear from our acharyas that our spiritual form and nature is always present. Maya means we're just not seeing it. Instead, one sees the body, lamentation, and illusion, although they have no permanent existence. Though flowers and horns exist, because they are not related to sky and a rabbit, a flower in the sky and a rabbit with horns are false. Similarly, though bodies and lamentation, confusion, happiness, and distress all exist as expansions of real matter, the body, lamentation, confusion, happiness, and distress are all called false in the scriptures because they have no relation to the jiva. Through the relationship of the jiva, though the relationship of the jiva with the body is false, it is produced by avidya and destroyed by vidya. Now this is going to be very important when we look at the how to get out of maya. So Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur is saying, the body is real, lamentation, illusion, confusion, happiness, and distress, they're all real, and you're real, but these things have nothing to do with you. Just like a horn is real and a rabbit is real, but rabbits don't have horns. And the flower is real, and the sky is real, but there aren't flowers floating in the sky. So this body and all the emotions of this body have nothing to do with us. And thinking that they do is an illusion. 
Prabhupada gives the example of a Mahamaya of these scientists and doctors who say that you know, life is just a combination of matter, but as soon as the body dies, when all the matter is there, they can't make it come alive. You can't build a Frankenstein monster, in other words. You, you can't just take a bunch of body parts and put them together and electrify it, and it's going to be alive. Or you're talking about, I, I find it interesting, he talks about the, uh, the psychologists who say that the mind is the brain. I mean, there's so much evidence that the mind is not the brain. And it's a very interesting stories in medicine of people who only have literally half a brain, but a fully functioning mind. Or people whose, you know, part of their brain is damaged and some other part of the brain takes it over and they have some, it's, it's some amazing stories. And of course we know that people can leave their body and still have a functioning mind all of the out-of-body experiences. So one time I was, uh, this one lady was coming regularly to Bhaktivedanta Manor, but her husband was an atheist and a materialist, and she asked me if I would preach to him. So I just started preaching to him about the difference of the subtle body to the gross body. I didn't go immediately to the spiritual, because he think, thought everything was matter. And I said, there is so much empirical evidence for out-of-body experiences. I mean, there, there's so much, and it can't be explained any other way, and it just can't be ignored. What are you going to do? Someone's on the operating table, you know, in the, and they have an out-of-body experience, and they're floating at the ceiling, and they see a label on the light bulb on the top that can't be seen from the bottom. Now, how did they do that? How, how can that be explained? It just can't be explained except that the person had to be able to leave their body and still have a mind. And the body was dead. The, the brain wasn't functioning, the heart wasn't functioning, and the person still had a mind. And again, there's, there's so many thousands and thousands and thousands of out-of-body experience stories, and most of the people telling these stories are sane, sober, respectable people in society. And Sadhaputta Prabhu brought up the point that if we dismiss all this evidence, we'd have to dismiss human evidence completely. You know, when you have thousands and thousands of people who give this kind of evidence, you have to give it some credence. And that's just the subtle body, what to speak of the soul. On the level of full spiritual awareness, we're not even using the mind. As Prabhupada explains in 328, 34, 35, I believe, that the actual ultimate spiritual samadhi has nothing to do even with the subtle mind. It's directly with the spiritual body. So our spiritual body doesn't even need the material mind. Our material mind doesn't need the physical brain, and our spiritual body doesn't need the material mind. It has its own mental functions, so to speak, its own intellectual functions. It's, it's above all these things. The mind is also a machine. So if we're going to go on to what is yoga maya, so also Srila Prabhupada and Aracharyas in relation to this verse talk about yoga maya. So the difference between yoga maya and mahamaya is yoga means to link. So yoga maya is an energy of linking with the Lord. It's a kind of illusion that brings us closer to the Lord. Mahamaya brings us away from the Lord. So some examples that Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur gives is Mother Yasoda seeing the universal form and then seeing Krishna as her beloved child. Oh, Krishna is just my little, let me, let me forget this. Let me just see Krishna as my child. That's yoga mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Yasoda unable to tie up Krishna, although he had bells tied around his waist, is Yogamaya. And he gives the example of Krishna being simultaneously present to Shrutadeva and Bahulasva, and being simultaneously present to Rukmini and Satyabhama. That by Krishna's Yogamaya, he can perform these pastimes in all different places. And one for, the, the Shrutadeva and Bahulasva, they didn't see the other Krishna. They just saw Krishna who was with them. So that's yoga maya. 
And the example that Sadaputra Prabhu gives in relationship to the verse Ekopi Sorajai Tam Jagananda Koti about space is the story of when our Lord Brahma went to see uh, Lord Vishnu. Right? And he comes, knocks on the door. I'm come to see the Lord. And the doorkeeper says, Who are you? Who am I? I'm Brahma. Can't you tell I'm Brahma? And then he goes to the Lord, and the Lord says, Ask him which Brahma. And the doorkeeper comes back and says, The Lord wants to know which Brahma. Which Brahma? Like what? Which Brahma? The four headed Brahma, you know, the father of the four Kumaras. All right, all right, come in. And then our Lord Brahma comes in, and the Lord calls Brahmas from many, many, many universes. Prabhupada says there's innumerable Brahmas. And our Lord Brahma sees that there's 10-headed Brahmas, and 1,000-headed Brahmas, and 10,000-headed Brahmas, and 1,000,000-headed Brahmas. And the Lord says to them, how's everything going? And they say, by your grace, we are victorious and the demons are defeated. Now, it's explained that only our Lord Brahma saw all the other Lord Brahmas. All the other Lord Brahmas thought it was just them and the Lord. And each Brahma thought that this event was happening in their universe. Remember we were talking about this time-space thingy? So each Lord Brahma thinks, this is, I'm, I'm just meeting with the Lord called me, and I come and I'm seeing him in the Sweta Dweep in my universe. So that's yoga maya. How the Lord does that so that each of these Lord Brahmas think that I'm only with Krishna in my universe. And of course, this happens with the cowherd boys where Krishna is in the center of, of these concentric circles and each cowherd boy thinks Krishna is only looking at me. And you got to remember, some of the cowherd boys are behind him. See, I can't do that. When I'm looking at you, then I'm not looking at you. And if I'm looking at you, then I'm not looking at you. And if, if I have people behind me, which happens sometimes, like now you have the Vyasa sun is kind of in the middle of the room. And sometimes I'm in temples where, the, where they put the Vyasa sun, like at a Sunday feast, there's people behind me. And the, the way I was trained in public speaking is you should periodically make eye contact with everybody, and so I end up going like this. <laughs> to the people that are back there to make sure that they also feel included. So Krishna doesn't have to do that. He's in one place and everybody perceives. Oh, and not only do they perceive Krishna is looking at them, they perceive Krishna is only looking at them. Srila Sanatana Goswami says, each cowherd boy thinks, I am Krishna's favorite, and he actually is. Or, you know, each gopi thinking, Krishna is only dancing with me in the Ras Lila. You know, and it says that Krishna is sitting by each gopi and, and either, either he's massaging her feet or she's massaging her feet, depending on how the verses are translated. And each gopi is thinking, you know, it's just me talking with Krishna. What are all these other thousands or millions of gopis doing? I don't know, but it's just me and Krishna. And so that's, that's yoga maya. And uh, we should... We should get out of yoga maya. So, that's, so Prabhupada, we should get out of Mahamaya and get into yoga maya. So Prabhupada has this amazing point in the purport of the Bhagavatam, which he says in other places. No, I'm sorry, it's the Chaitanya Charitamrita purport, where he says, what is this again? I'm going to just read it, so make sure I get it exactly right. Okay. Actually, the living entities are not illusory, for they are parts of the superior energy of the Supreme Lord and do not have to be covered by maya if they do not want to be so. There's other places where Prabhupada says very similar things that we can get out of maha maya and get into yoga maya just by desiring to do so. And when I read these, I don't know about all of you, but when I read these things, I go, it doesn't feel like that. I feel like I've been desiring to get out of Mahamaya and into Yoga Maya for a very long time, and I'm still stuck. Okay. Now, we do need to have mercy. Like Prabhupada, on his, um, in his poem he wrote when he was first coming to America, he said, by your will you've put everyone into illusion, and by your will you can also remove that illusion. 
So we do also have to have mercy. And again, turning to Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on the Bhagavatam verse, he talks about this mercy. He says, when pure bhakti, which is mercy of the Lord incarnate and the essence of the chit shakti, becomes very strong and prominent by amount and type, it is completely independent and does not consider good or bad, and may appear suddenly within conditioned jivas, even a bad conduct, or who are born as rakshasas, pulindas, or pukasas, whereas it may not appear within brahmanas or sannyasis, even if they are liberated. By that bhakti alone, all suffering, including avidya, is destroyed. So that sounds very whimsical and random, if you just take it on face value. There's this energy of the Lord called bhakti, who's like, ah, there's a really fallen, you know, pukasa, whoever that, whoever that is. I don't know what a pukasa is. Probably, I'm a pukasa, I don't know. But just this, like, there's a pukasa, and I'm just going to give them bhakti. <laughs> And there's a liberated sannyasi who's already Brahman realized, nah, I'm not going to give him bhakti. So it just, it kind of sounds like that. But there's really an interplay between the mercy of the Lord and our desire. And that's true from, in Mahamaya too. You know, each of us have this particular body and this particular life experiences given to us by Mahamaya because we wanted it. Now, we wanted it foolishly, and we may not have realized how we wanted it. Kind of like if I park in an illegal parking space, on one level, I want to get a ticket. You know, but what I'm, how I'm, the way I'm thinking in Mahamaya is, I'm going to park in this illegal space and not get a ticket. Or I don't know how this works, but somehow I still seem to believe that I can have an extra piece of cheesecake and not feel full, too full after the meal. I don't, I don't know why I believe that. After all my life experiences, that if I have that extra piece of cheesecake, I will feel uncomfortable. You know, I've experienced this so many times, but I'm thinking, well, this time it won't happen, you know? Or if I stay up too late, I'll feel tired the next day. No, I'll be able to do that. You know, I, I can do that, it'll work. I can stay up to 11 and, and wake up at 3.30 and feel refreshed. And like, well, it never worked before. <laughs> so, you know, this, in one sense, everything we have in this world is due to our desire. But in another sense, we have this kind of thinking again, we, I have this unlimited independence that I'm thinking that, okay, well, I don't really desire the results of my activities. I desire the cheesecake. I desire to park wherever I like. I desire to stay up to 11 o'clock at night, and I don't really desire the results of that. But actually, we do desire. It, it, it's a package. It's a package. And I, I really, I am actually preferring to feel too full or to feel tired rather than to eat less or to sleep properly. Does that make sense? I, re I really am saying I prefer that. That's what I prefer, although I'm not honest with myself about my preferences. And therefore, Maya is giving me a suitable body and a suitable psychology and a suitable life according to my desire, right? And so in each life, we're thinking, huh, I think I'd like it more this way or I think I'd like it more this way. Like I like to quote Julia Roberts, who took initiation from some, some guru in Vrindavan and calls herself a, uh, a Hindu. And she said, you know, in this life, I'm, real, I'm at the front and I'm famous and... And next life, I want to be in the back and quiet. And I thought, if we, if we think like that too, you know, well, I'm, I'm too shy. I wish I was more outgoing. Okay, you got to get another life. <laughs> Whatever it is. I, I, I wish I wasn't like this. I wish I wasn't like that. I wish I was like this instead. Then we have to get another life. So if that's true materially, that Krishna is responding to our desires, then why wouldn't that be true spiritually? Much more, because when I have spiritual desires, that's also Krishna's desire. If I want to be an outgoing person or a shy person in this world, or I want to be expert at flying or expert at swimming or expert at this or expert at that in this world, that's not actually Krishna's desire for me. So he'll fulfill that desire, but none of us are happy with the result. 
But when I want to regain my eternal spiritual form and I want to serve Krishna, that's what Krishna wants. And so certainly he'll fulfill it. So that mercy is a natural and, and almost, almost we can say automatic response. If we think it's automatic, then it doesn't happen, if that makes any sense. If I think, well, if I, if I desire spiritually, Krishna is obliged to give me bhakti, then he'll go, nah, you kind of missed the boat on that one. But it, it is really his natural response. All right, so what can we do? And I got these quotes, and I had so much fun. I love these, these quotes. Can't read it like that. You've got to get bigger. All right. So this is from a lecture on the Nectar Devotion in 1972. So the so-called sannyasi, Brahma Satya Jigan Mitya, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, he's quoting a verse from 10 to 32. To the Vaishnavas, to the devotees, we cannot accept that this jagat, this world, is false. No, how can it be false? And I talked about this yesterday. Suppose you enter into a very beautiful garden, very nice trees, so many nice flowers. Everything is, they are nice. The proprietor of the garden takes you to show you. So I had this experience yesterday that uh, Thibault took me around the garden and I was admiring this squash and the chard is amazing. And the kale, right? Oh, this is all mitya, this is all false. How much depressed he becomes, just see. I brought this friend to show the beauty of this garden and he says it is false. Similarly, we don't want to depress Krishna. That is not our business. Krishna has created this nice world. Everything is very nice. The sun is rising just in exact time. It is setting in exact time. The moon is rising. The seasons are changing. And we are getting nice food, nice fruit, nice flowers. So we are not meant to be a depressing agent. We won't discourage Krishna. <laughs> Why? Krishna has created this nice world. How can I say it is mitya? It is the byproduct of Krishna's energy. So Krishna's energy cannot be false. The difference is that the devotee relishes a particular type of mellow rasa in the material world. We can experience rasa in this world when we see the world in relation to Krishna. But those who are not devotees, they do not feel any relish from this material world. They feel for some time, but when it becomes stale, they say it is false just like the jackal who wanted to get the grapes and then said, the grapes are sour, I don't require. So except devotees, the non-devotees, the karmis, gyanis, yogis, they do not relish the sweetness of the creation of Krishna. So you know that song, Madharadi Patera Kimam Madharam, and at the end it's Shristi Madhura. Shristi Madhura. Your creation is also sweet. Okay, we have another one. a bunch of these. Material things means, as I repeatedly explained, forgetful of Krishna. Otherwise, there is no, nothing material. It is illusion. Illusion means actually there is nothing material. How can it be material? If the Supreme Lord is Supreme Spirit, everything is coming from him. So what we call the material energy that is also coming from Krishna. Oh, I didn't tell you where this is from. This is from another Nectar Devotion Lecture in 1972. In Vrindavan. But the difficulty is that in this inferior energy, inferior energy means where there is a possibility of forgetting Krishna. Actually, that is the fact. People are engaged in so many activities. The result is that they're forgetting Krishna. That is material. Material means forgetfulness of Krishna. Otherwise, there is nothing except Krishna. Idamhi Vishvam Bhagavan Ivetara, which I quoted yesterday. For Hamaha Bhagavata, he has no such conception, material conception. He sees everywhere Krishna. He is seeing one tree, but he is forgetful of the tree. He's seeing energy of Krishna. As soon as he sees the energy of Krishna, he sees Krishna. And again, I can't read all of this. In the morning, as soon as you see within your window the sunshine, immediately you remember sun. You're confident this sun is there. Similarly, whatever we see, if we see Krishna, because that particular thing is the manifestation of the energy of Krishna. So those who have understood Krishna, along with his energies, he does not see anything except Krishna. Therefore, for him, there is no material world. There is no material world. To a perfect devotee, there is no material world. How many times did Prabhupada say that? Three times. Everything is spiritual. Sarva kalami dambrama. 
He sees everything as Brahman. So we have to make our eyes to see Krishna. Tat parate manirmalam. Sarvapati vinirmuktam tat parate manirmalam. Rishikesha rishikeva sevanam bhakti ruchite. As soon as we are in Krishna consciousness, our seeing, touching, smelling, everything becomes nirmala, purified. Then we can immediately see Krishna. Are these fun? Yes. Okay. Oops. Sometimes my phone does what I want it to do, and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. This is from the purport to Bhagavatam 10.10.5. This is really interesting. It's kind of looking at it from the other point of view. Within the waters of the Mandakini Ganges, which were crowded with gardens of lotus flowers, the two sons of Kuvera would enjoy young girls just like two male elephants enjoying in the water with female elephants. Srila Prabhupada's purport. People generally go to the Ganges to be purified of the effects of sinful life. But here is an example of how a foolish person entered the Ganges to become involved in sinful life. It is not that everyone becomes purified by entering the Ganges. Everything spiritual and material depends on one's mental condition. Ten, ten, I have to open it again. Ten, ten, five. Proper translations go up to ten, thirteen. Okay, this is from Purport 422, 28. Being covered by material desires, a spirit soul is also considered to be covered by designations belonging to a particular type of body. Thus he considers himself an animal, man, demigod, bird, beast, etc., in so many ways, he's influenced by false identification called by, caused by false egotism. And being covered by illusory material desires, he distinguishes between matter and spirit. When one is devoid of such distinctions, there is no longer a difference between matter and spirit. At that time, the spirit is the only predominating factor. As long as one is covered by material desires, he thinks himself the master or the enjoyer, Thus, he acts for sense gratification and becomes subjected to material pangs, happiness, and distress. But when one is free from such a concept of life, he is no longer subjected to designations, and he envisions everything as spiritual in connection with the Supreme Lord. Interesting. So why do we see things as material? Because we want to enjoy them. It's, it's our material desires that attract the Lord to put this covering over us. Because people want to play computer games, therefore businesses manufacture them and sell them. If nobody wanted them, they wouldn't sell them. Because people want to go on amusement park rides, therefore there's amusement parks. And you, you have to get the game or the ride from something outside of yourself. Someone has to strap you into the ride, you know, you have to get a machine and hook up to the, to the game or whatever, or movies. You know, they create all these movies because people want to be an illusion. Let me, let me identify with the character who you know, jumps out of helicopters and doesn't get any bruises. Let, let me just, let me have this illusion. So I, I want to see things as separately from Krishna. I want to think I'm supremely independent and the supreme enjoyer. So Krishna covers us with this illusion by which we stop seeing him and by which we see that reality can be exploited. I, I act, if I were to see, just like, like think about meat eaters. If a meat eater sees the animal as a living being with desires and feeling just like themselves, it's almost impossible to, to then exploit the animal, isn't it? it? It's almost impossible. I mean, it's possible. Some people are so warped that they can do that, but that, that's not usually the case. They see the animals as an object that they can exploit. All exploitation is, is based, you know, we talked about objectifying people. And I see the world as dead matter. I see it as objects that I can exploit. I can take this table, this chair, and I can do whatever I want with it because it doesn't care, it's dead matter, I can exploit it. 
But remember we talked about yesterday, how it isn't really, because it's part of the body of God. So it is actually spiritual. But if I were to see that, my ability to exploit it would, would vanish. I, I just wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to think that I'm the Lord. Is this making sense to everybody? Yeah? If Krishna were to show us this world is his body and everything here is spiritual, everything is alive, and I'm just part of him, it would be impossible for me to maintain this thing that I'm the center of the universe and I'm very important and all other living beings are, are really, they're not really, they don't really have the kind of feelings that I do. Or if they do, my needs are, are more important than theirs. I mean, it, it's, it, it operates on such a, a level, even in dealing with devotees. Like, it happens to me frequently that someone will come and say, Ermila, I really need to talk to you about something. And I'll say, well, I'm really tired right now, I have to rest. But this is very important. And I'll say, I, it may be very important, but I have to rest right now. I'll talk to you later. Like, is the world going to fall apart if I don't talk to you right now? Like, is, is you know... Is there going to be an atom bomb? And this mentality is thinking, my needs supersede your needs. You know, on the extreme level, that comes to things like murder and rape and theft. You know, my need for wealth is more important than yours, and therefore I can take something that belongs to you without your possession, without your permission. That's what, what rape and stealing is all about, right? I can take your possessions or I can take your body when you're not willing to give them to me because my desires and my needs are more important than yours. But it comes even on the very subtle level, taking someone's time and energy that they're not willing to give you right now or in ways that they're not willing to give you. You know, using any, anyone in any way that they're not voluntarily giving you because I'm the enjoyer. I have, I have the right. And in order to do that, we have to stop seeing the other person as another living being with their own needs and their own desires. As soon as we do, we, we couldn't do that anymore. And it, it was such a revelation to me when I saw, oh my God, I do this. I think other people are obliged because what I need is so urgent and it's so important that they have to be willing to put aside their desires and their needs at my demand. And I was like, wow, this, that's terrible. What a horrible thing. I don't want to do that anymore. And again, this goes to the extreme of, of, of meat-eating and rape and theft and murder and, and things like this, where I can just take but in order to have this, whether it's at a very, like Prabhu says, the thief of a diamond or the thief of a cucumber, they're all thieves. So whether it's on a really gross level that I'm stealing someone else's country, <laughs> you know, or whether it's a really tiny level that I'm trying to suck someone's time and energy that they don't want to give me, all of this depends on not seeing the world as divine. So it is a contradiction to want to maintain an exploitive mentality and see the world as divine. So when we're thinking, yes, I desire to see the world as divine. Yes, I desire to be in spiritual consciousness. Yes, I have a desire to be in the... I really want it. But if I'm thinking, you know, I'd be so much better able to exploit in that situation. God, I'd have access to desire trees. I'd have the Lord in, in my hand. Prabhupada says the pure devotee holds the Lord in his hand. I'd have the Lord in my hand. Well, I'd really be able to exploit that. And if, that's, if that is, is maintained in us to any degree, then we don't really want to see the divine. And Krishna is going to respond to our actual desires. So the whole idea of sadhana bhakti, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 12.9, is to change our desires. 
That's the purpose of our sadhana. The purpose isn't, you know, to check off a list. Okay, 16 rounds, okay. Were they pretty attentive? Yeah, pretty attentive. Three guy trees, okay, I did that. Was that pretty attentive? Yeah, it was pretty attentive, okay. How many pages did I read? Read this many pages in the Bhagavatam. Did I wave the incense and ring the bell? Yeah, I did that. Did I eat prasadam? Yeah, did I try? Did I say the prayer before prasadam? Yeah, okay, I did that. Like a checklist. The idea is that we're actually trying to change our desires. We're trying to, to, to revive our original desire to be happy as a servant and to be happy as a part of God and not to try to take Krishna's place. To see that I already have everything that I could ever want as part of Krishna. Now, in doing this, we also practice using the material energy in his service. We, we behave as if we saw the world as divine, even if we don't yet. So, okay, I'm going to use this chair in Krishna's service. I'm going to use this pumpkin in Krishna's service. I'm going to use my clothes in Krishna's service. I'm going to use my body in Krishna's service. I'm, I'm going to act as if I had that vision because when we act as if we had that vision, we end up feeling happier, and that ends up thinking, oh, I really would like to have that vision. Also, as part of our sadhana, which I'm just going to spend 10 seconds talking about, is this detachment from the, the body and the emotions of the body. That they're real. The, what did Vishnu Chakravati Thakur say? The lamentation, the illusion, the... What were all those things? They're, they're all real. They're all Krishna's energy, but they have nothing to do with me. The, the thoughts that go through my mind, the emotions that go through my mind, the desires that go through my mind, they are not me. So this is a, attachment and detachment. I focus on building up my desire to really be Krishna's servant. Where it's like, if someone says, do you want to just be an insignificant servant a thousand times removed, that my heart goes, yes, instead of, oh, a thousand times removed? Mm -hmm. I'll be nothing. So to change that attractive desire and then to become detached from the machine of the mind saying, don't you want this? Don't you feel this? Don't you want this? Don't you feel this? You feel this. You think this. You want this. And you know, that's not me. So thank you very much. And uh, then tomorrow we, um, we have a, um, there's a break tomorrow. And then on Friday, we'll do verse 3 of the Chatra Sloki, and on Saturday, verse 4. So again, I don't have time to read all the full purports in the class, and if you can read that beforehand, that would be... I'm just, I'm just reading bits of the, of the purports, so if you can read that before class, that would be very nice. Thank you very much.